The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hi, and welcome back to The Learning Circuit. In a previous episode, we've learned about capacitors, but I want to bring a little bit more information to you, so I've brought back special guest, James the Bald Engineer, Lewis. Hi, James. Hey, Karen. Thanks for having me back. It's great to have you back. So, what are you going to tell us about today? I'm covering a special type of capacitor called a polymer, or polymer electrolytic. In this video, I'm going to show their basic technology and performance characteristics. In a follow-up video, I'll go through and show how they work in an actual circuit. Sounds great! Take it away, James! Karen did a great job covering the basics of capacitors. If you haven't watched her video, you should go check that one out. I am going to jump up a few levels and talk about a specific type called polymers. In this video, I cover what they are, the different types, how they perform, and compare them to multi-layer ceramic capacitors. Now, my experience has been when I start talking about capacitors, people start to have questions. My answers usually start with, it depends on something. I suggest you take notes while watching. That way you can leave comments on element 14. It'll be much easier for me to answer them there. First, let me explain what I mean by polymer capacitor. Usually, capacitors are named after their dielectric, like film or ceramic. Metal capacitors are technically named after their anode material instead of their oxide, which is the dielectric. Polymers are strange because they're named after their cathode material. Side note, the name polymer is a little confusing because some manufacturers refer to film capacitors as polymers since the film is actually a polymer. However, the industry at large tends to refer to polymer capacitors as the ones I'm talking about in this video. If we want to be technically accurate, we should actually call them polymer electrolytic capacitors. As a quick review, a capacitor is made up of two electrode plates with a dielectric material. For polymer capacitors, the anode is metal, the dielectric is its oxide, and the cathode is a material called poly 3 4 ethylene dioxy theophen polystyrene sulfonate. <laughs> Fortunately, it is also known as PDIT, or as I say, PDOT. The form used in capacitors is actually PDOT PSS. In traditional aluminum electrolytic capacitors, the cathode is a wet electrolyte. PDOT replaces that liquid electrolyte with a solid material. This polymer provides a couple of advantages. First, it is highly conductive, which reduces the capacitor's ESR. Second, it does not attack the oxide layer like a traditional electrolyte would so the capacitor will have a significantly longer operational life. And third, there is no hydrogen outgassing. Modern computer systems have moved towards aluminum polymer cans because of those advantages. Plus, you do not have to worry about the electrolyte leaking out and damaging a board. While these are the most common types of polymer capacitors, there are others on the market. The two common form factors are a can and a chip. The can has a wound construction that allows for higher capacitance values. The chip style is a layered approach which offers lower ESR while taking up less volume. There is a type of aluminum polymer called a hybrid. It contains both the polymer and a traditional electrolyte. This combination gives the capacitor a very low ESR with slightly higher voltage and capacitance ratings. Aluminum, or for my UK friends, aluminium, is not the only metal used. Tantalum is an exceptionally common polymer electrolytic capacitor type. It comes in a chip form, but its internal construction is very different from the aluminum type. The anode is a centered pellet made of tiny particles. Side note, there is a lot of controversy that surrounds tantalum. First, it is known as a conflict mineral, so it is important to make sure that your supplier has a conflict-free supply chain. By the way, Gold and tin are other common elements used in electronics that are also classified as conflict minerals. Second, tantalum capacitors have a history of um, exploding. Traditional tantalum capacitors were made with a cathode material called manganese dioxide, or MnO2. If there was a crack in the dielectric, too much current would flow through it, heating the MnO2, converting it to Mn2O3. That meant an extra oxygen atom sitting around with a heat source, which normally means fire. Polymer tantalum capacitors, however, do not have that oxygen source and do not explode when they fail. 
Third, there is a misunderstanding about the reliability of tandem capacitors. Wonder where that came from. I'll just summarize to say, polymer tandem capacitors are significantly more reliable than their older MNO2 cousins when properly voltage derated. Okay, so then why do we even bother using tantalum? Why not just use aluminum? Well, for the same 7343 chip size, you can either get an aluminum with 560 microfarads or a tantalum with 1500 microfarads. Manufacturers call tantalum polymers a volumetrically efficient capacitor, and they're very popular in mobile devices. Before I move on to talk about performance characteristics, I want to cover a common question. How do I know if I'm selecting a polymer or not? The data sheet for the capacitor will explicitly state whether it is a traditional construction or one using polymer. There are also some trade names like OSCON or KOCAP, which can help identify them as well. While polymer electrolytic capacitors are usually used for bulk decoupling, I often see them used in switching supplies. That means we need to see how their impedance, ESR, and capacitance change across frequency. Here is an impedance and ESR curve for a 100 microfarad polymer tantalum. Notice how the impedance has a sharp V shape towards the capacitor's self-resonant frequency, or SRF. The ESR bottoms out at around 10 kHz and stays stable until about 10 MHz. This performance is very similar to how a ceramic capacitor would respond to frequency and very different from a traditional electrolytic capacitor. Now I'll switch the plot to capacitance across frequency. And here's the real magic behind the polymers. The self-resonant frequency is still at 363 kHz, which means this capacitor is best suited for a 100 kHz switching power supply since it has its full effective capacitance at 100 kHz. But here's the thing, all of these measurements are at room temperature, or 25 degrees Celsius. What if we go to extremes like negative 55 to positive 105 degrees Celsius? Well, it turns out that this capacitor would only vary between 98 and 121 microfarads. It's very stable across temperature. As you might imagine, I'm sort of headed somewhere with these comparisons. I'm going to compare them to a ceramic capacitor, but before I do that, I did want to mention one trade-off when using polymers. An overlooked characteristic is leakage current. This is the current that ends up flowing through the dielectric. In an ideal capacitor, there would be none, but all capacitors have some. Polymers offer limited voltage proofing or healing compared to their traditional counterparts. So for either aluminum or tantalum, when you look at their leakage, the polymers will usually be one order of magnitude or 10 times higher and that difference could be very important in battery-powered applications. If you're trying to replace a multi-layer ceramic capacitor, or MLCC, in a design, you do need to consider the four ways that they lose capacitance. First is the tolerance range, but that affects all capacitors, so. Second is the temperature coefficient. Ceramics fit into class one, two, and three coefficients. Class one changes very little, while class two is considered stable, even though it can vary plus or minus 15%. And class three, okay, no, you know what? I'm not even going to discuss those. The third method is becoming better understood in the industry. It is with applied DC voltage. If you put five volts on a 6.3 volt rated capacitor, the effective capacitance could drop by as much as 80%. Now, I would need an entire other video to explain why that occurs, but I will show you an example later. And fourth is a process called aging. From the time the capacitor is manufactured or goes through a reflow oven, its capacitance naturally decays. It's called aging, but it isn't actually destructive. You can actually reset the clock. I needed to point those four losses out because they are unique to ceramic capacitors. Well, except for the tolerance. Let's look at a graph for a 100 microfarad X5R ceramic capacitor. Here you see the sharp V-shaped impedance, like we did with the polymer, and the green line is the ESR, which this manufacturer says is stable with frequency. Looking at capacitance across frequency, its capacitance is rated as 73 microfarads at 100 kilohertz, since this is a 20% tolerance capacitor. But wait, there's more. Watch what happens when I apply 5 volts to this ceramic capacitor, which was rated for 6.3 volts. At 100 kilohertz, the effective capacitance is now only 20 microfarads. 
I'm letting that sink in for a minute. Okay, maybe not a minute. This particular ceramic loses 80% of its capacitance just because we applied five volts to it. Oh, and once again, this is at room temperature. Don't forget that temperature and time will reduce its capacitance as well. Now, I wanna be clear. I am not trying to slam ceramics, nor this vendor, nor say you should not use them. However, you must take into account their characteristics before you can design them in. You may not actually need a 100 microfarad polymer capacitor to replace a 100 microfarad ceramic capacitor. With that said, when making this change, pay very close attention to the ESR and impedance of the capacitor types. While polymers, both aluminum and tantalum, will have very low ESRs, they will still be a bit higher for a similar ceramic. <sighs> Normally when I do talks on capacitors, they last over an hour. So I packed a lot into this short video. Do you remember when I suggested you take notes? Well, now's the time to send in your questions. In the description, we'll provide a link to the right place on element 14 for you to ask them. For a next step, I was thinking about showing how different capacitor types affect ripple voltage with this power supply evaluation board. Let me know if that sounds like something that you would be interested in seeing. I'd like to thank Karen again for letting me come on to talk about capacitor types. For now, it's time to get back to my... Oh, wait, wrong show. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in another video.